in 1972, I, uh, we were uh, starting Lakota Studies programs way back in 1960s, but 1972, we started teaching um, language in the schools. And the schools resisted. I remember in 1968, I went to the superintendent here and asked him if we could teach Lakota history or language. And he laughed at me. He said, why? And it's interesting, because at the time, I couldn't explain why, you know. The only reason I did that was uh, my son was starting Head Start, and I panicked, because uh, I know what he was getting into in the school system. And I felt like something has to be done, and I didn't know what. The only thing I could think of was pride. You know, you have to be proud of who you are, where you come from. And at that time, when you're in those education systems, it's bad to be Indian. It's evil to be Indian. You know, they, they always tell us, you speak uh, backwards language, you know. <coughs> and uh, uh, we're savages, you know, we have to be civilized. Uh, so that's all you learn in school, briefly, of uh, how bad you are. So when you come out of those schools, you really, you really don't have any pride of who you are. If anything, you come out of there just ashamed, embarrassed. And you come out with a third grade level of education and uh, total dependency. You have a very limited vocabulary of English and Lakota. And uh, your whole world is just here, okay? You can't see beyond out there because you don't know. They don't teach you. They don't teach you to look beyond to see what's over the hill. You know, how do you describe uh, a beautiful sunset if you don't have the words for it? You know. So you just go from day to day. You react to whatever happens that day. And you wait for somebody to come along and say, do this. And I've always been, uh, uh, I never did like authority, you know, ever since I could remember, because I grew up in Spring Creek, where we were, we were very free. We spoke our language day in and day out. You know, we play in our language. Well, we sing, we dance. We're happy. We laugh in our language, you know. And uh, when I was 16, I went into a boarding school. I barely spoke English. And they put me in with the eighth graders because of my age. And uh, all those high school, uh, eighth graders in high school, really ridicule us, those of us that come from the country. Call us big Indians, buck Indians. Hey, you guys speak a backwards language. That's the first time I heard that. And I found out that they had been in that institution since they were five. So 
So by the time they're teenagers, they've already been conditioned to deny their Indianness. It really worked. On Saturdays, they have Western movies. John Wayne. <laughs> no. It's really funny because we used to sit there and uh, cheer for the cowboys and the cavalry, you know, when they fought the Indians. And we laugh at the Indians. <laughs> I mean, that's how well the boarding school system develops. Because you're in it from the time you're five, and that's the way they raise you. So when I went in there at 16, I couldn't believe what was going on. You know, and I saw what was happening. I saw physical punishment, verbal punishment, and this was in the 50s, 1950s. Boy, those scholastics and nuns were tough. Boy, they, they designed punishment that get their message across to you. Physical punishment. They really whip you into a submission. So I've seen all that. So I can see why your grandparents never passed this on to you. Because they were afraid for you. They didn't pass it on to your parents. Because they don't want your parents to be hurt in school. In 1968, I talked to the elders who are fluent speakers. And I mentioned English language. And they said, forget it. When we die, that's it. And that's when I panicked, you know. We can't lose this, you know. So that's when we started pushing for Indian education in school. And St. Francis became an Indian school and we kept pushing it. Finally, they called me and said, we'll give you a half hour during noon hour so you can play your tape and dance. <laughs> that was their idea of Indian studies, you know. <coughs> and I really get into debate with the priest and the scholastics over education. And I did some research, and uh, we really fought for time. I went to the Todd County School Board, and I approached them, and they didn't know what to do, this and that, and the superintendent was against it. And I was so mad, I got up and I said, well, maybe I shouldn't do this, maybe I should respect you, but I said, well, after what I hear today, as far as I'm concerned, I said, all of you can go to hell. <laughs> and I just walked out. <laughs> and here they called me back to help them set something up. <laughs> but it's a, it was a real struggle. And when we got into school, we had to develop curriculum. I mean, we had no lessons. How do you teach language in a classroom setting? You know. How do you pass on oral traditions in a classroom setting? Oh, oh, by 15 years, we tried everything. Revise, develop, revise. The book I wrote on a language, well, I started that back in 1973. And I finally printed about 20 years later, 25 years later. But I had to go to a series of meetings with uh, all other language teachers to go over that. So it took us a while to develop some system, methods, for classroom uh, teaching. And uh, I found out the best I can do is just go into history and bring you up to date and say, here's where you're at. Here's what you have. You do what you want to do with this. 
That's your decision. I learned to respect the intelligence of my students, the minds of my students. I learned to respect them because I learned a great deal. I read some of your papers, really good papers. You can really write. It's good to see that. When we first started here, man, it was a struggle. You're lucky if you start with, like when nine of us started here, you start with nine students and end up with one <laughs> at the end of the semester when the college first started. So it was really, really hard, but it's getting a lot better. I mean, I, I'm really happy today uh, with the writing skills you have, research skills you have, and the questions you ask. That's what really helps uh, to develop that. So uh, what we'll do today uh, is we're going to cover Teospaya. And uh, I want you to read that book, I mean that handout, the Drinking Party. And next week, tell me what happened. You know, you've read Land of Spotted Eagle, the first six chapters. Okay. Have you watched the creation story? Yeah. You can watch it on YouTube. Uh, if you missed that class, it's on YouTube. Yeah, I watched it. Okay. I was there early and I was able to yeah. finish. So any class you miss, just go to YouTube because they're recording it. So. SG, oh. SG YouTube. Yeah. Under I tried that last year. Uh, when Jim and I were talking and we tried that and it really turned out good with the students because sometimes students have a hard time uh, some students have a hard time with babysitting or other things they couldn't uh, get to class but they could watch and uh, retention was really good Uh, you didn't get the drinking party, huh? I didn't get the drinking party. Did you get the drinking party? Oh, and I was not sleeping. Oh, somehow they, I didn't get one, but I signed in. Oh. But I'll, uh, I'll get you some copies after class. Yeah, yeah I need a copy of handout. Handout. Okay. Sorry. And I was going to tell you, in 1972, uh, I was working with Pine Ridge Schools. We were sharing materials. They come up with research and we shared stories. And one time I went to Kyle. I and this other teacher went to Kyle and um, we went through their stuff. And I found this story, this drinking party. And I asked him, I said, who wrote this? They don't know. They don't know who wrote it. And that's why I just make copies. You know. But uh, I brought it back and I read it. This teacher that helped me read it to the students every day and they really liked it. So I thought, well, this would be good to use to see where we're at, what happened to us. So next week when I come back, we're going to have a little discussion of what happened to our people. No. I'll be absent next week, so if you want me to see email your paper on all the stuff that you wanted us to. That'd be great, oh. yeah. <laughs> okay. T. 
Chi is a third person, meaning he or she lives someplace. So if you say, Mission L T. He or she lives in Mission. Wati. Mission L Wati. Yeah. Or you can put uh, Jim. Mission L T. Jim lives in Mission. You have uh, a hole. Let's say this is a Sioux Nation. You know, made up of groups. Okay. Seven council fires. <laughs> you take one of these and a, that's an Oshpaya. Oshpaya means a small group from the main one. So a small group from the main one that lives together. That's all it means, a small group that lives together. To be a member of that Tiospaya, it's based on bloodline. Yeah. There's no blood quantum. As long as there's a trace of blood in you that connects you to this Tiospaya, you are a member of that Tiospaya. <coughs> Number two, you become a member through marriage. Okay, marriage. Number three, adoption. In Lakota culture, there's no concept of blood quantum. There's no degree of blood. <clears throat> you have a little blood of a Tiospaya, then that means you are a full member of that Tiospaya. All the privileges. There are different Tiospayas. They're all different from each other. Each one, they all have their own characteristics and personality. So they're all different that way. They all do things a little differently even though it's the same thing. They approach it differently. Some that chose by are travelers. They're entertainers. There are some that are pretty stable, steady going. They all have their own, what you would call, autonomy. They all have their own governing system. 
individuality is very important in Lakota culture. We don't think alike. We don't look alike. I was glad to hear that because sure as heck don't want to look like my brother-in-law, you know. <laughs> but we're all individuals. And we are all born with a gift. In a tears by a system, there is a very strict gender role. There's women's society in the men society. They all have their own uh, system of running and governing themselves. But they did it in a way that they complement each other. They're not fighting, but they work together. In a Teospai system, the woman is the foundation of that Teospai. When uh, When a young girl experiences her monthly cycle for the first time, her mother, her aunts, her grandmas <coughs> will all get together with her. And, uh, hey, I'll call you back, okay? And, uh, they all get together with that little girl. And they said they'll cry because that day they've lost a child. And then they will shed happy tears because a new member has come into their society. And they welcome her. They built a special lodge for her, in her honor for that. And they call that Ishnati. <coughs> Ishna is alone. She is live, living alone. They build a lodge for her. Special lodge for her. They will cater to her. It's a big honor. couple, maybe one or two elderly women <coughs> will spend those days with her. Teaching her basically survival <coughs> skills. You know, survival skills. They will teach her how to care for herself. and what she should expect if she has a family. They will teach her about the history of our people, the philosophy 
of our people. And most importantly, they will teach her what is a woman. You know. At the at that time, she becomes a young woman. And she's not a child anymore. So they brought her into the world of womanhood. They'll teach her about sex. And conceiving a child. They will teach her about childbearing. They'll teach her about birth, childbirth, and child rearing. For several months, they will teach her those things. Every month at that time, they'll put up that teepee and she will go through that training. Until she comes to a point where she understands. She understands who she is. She knows what a woman is and the potentials a woman has. When she comes to that point of understanding, they will tell her, during this time, the spirits that come into a ceremony, out of respect for you, they will not witness your bodily functions because they respect you. So during that time, the spirits will stay away from you as a way of respecting your privacy. So during that time, you must not go into a ceremony. You must not participate in any ceremonial settings, even making tobacco ties, offerings, sweat lodges, because they call the spirits when they do that. You must quietly remove yourself. When you do that, number one, you are showing respect and honor to yourself. And in doing that, you will get just as much blessings as if you were there, because you respect others. So that's why they always say, oh, a woman in her time shouldn't be present. Shouldn't be present in her time, and that's why they they still follow. And that comes with we have what they call natural laws. Okay. That teaching came from beginning of time in working with the spirits. So it's not a man-made rule. It came with creation, it came with development of who we are. The process, you know, ceremony. There are certain things we must follow and that's one of them. A boy at that age will also be taken aside. 
he will be given to the grandparents, the grandfather. The oldest one, the oldest boy in the family is usually given to the grandparents. <coughs> and the grandparents will raise him <coughs> with all the teachings and responsibilities of a man. So he can pass that on to his siblings as they come along. So boy is very uh, strictly taught too about discipline, reminding them that in our creation story, woman was created first to be like the earth, to give life and nourishment to life. The earth does that. A woman has that gift. Man was created to be like the universe, to nourish and protect the earth. The universe and the earth together create life. Man must protect and nourish the woman. And together, they create life. So these are things that were taught, especially at the time of puberty. You are taught those things. Respect. The, in a Chios by system, there will be several families within that Tios plan. There will be several families. And uh, they all basically follow the same philosophy. All of your mother's sisters are your mother's. If they're married, their husbands are like your fathers. Their offsprings, their children, are your brothers and sisters. All of your father's brothers are like your father. Their children become your brothers and sisters. So you're never an only child. And they raise you under that concept of mitakyo yasi, all my relatives. How that works. They used to <coughs> do what they call matchmaking. As a young woman, your parents don't want you to marry somebody that's ways quite different from the way you're raised. So they're going to try and find a match for you. That you both have common interest. You never go in a tios by and trying to change them. <laughs> when a young couple decides to live together, they decide which Tiosh by it they're going to go into. If they decided to go into her Tiosh by this man has to forget what he learned with his Tiosh by and adopt her Tiosh by his ways. The man in that Tiosh by. Vice versa. If she decides to come into 
demands to yours by it, then she has to adopt their ways. Yeah. We grew up, personally, we grew up with my mother's side of the Tiorspaya. Halhorn bear side. So I know very little about my dad's history. He's got some brothers from out eastern part of the reservation. I'm slowly finding them. I know all the relatives on my mother's side because that's the one we grew up under. And uh, <coughs> she always introduced me to a relative with a relative term. Lelekshia, you know, Lekshi, today we say it's uncle, but it's like saying uncle, but it's not really uncle. <laughs> you know, Lekshi is just another way of identifying a father like figure. That's what Lekshi is. Tchui is a birth woman. She's just like your mother. So it doesn't mean aunt. <laughs> Those are English terms that came in later. And then they put a measurement on it, so you have first cousin, third cousin, fourth. In Lakota, we don't have that. You know. Your seventh cousin is like your brother yeah. or your sister. So we don't have that measurement of a distant relative. So you're always trying to keep the family together that way. And I'm really... Uh, I've done a lot of work with a reservation here. There are some very strong Teoshpais here. Families. A lot of loyalty within that family. Family members, I've seen a lot of that. So that concept still exists today. The idea of relationship. <coughs> I have some, in English, you would call them cousins. In our language, they call me Misu. I'm the youngest of my generation, so they all call me Misu, which is younger brother. So I call them Chia, even though in English they're supposed to be first, second, third cousin. <laughs> but we don't use that. <coughs> like Dwayne is my nephew. And uh, his, uh, his dad is the son of one of mom's brothers. So he always calls me Miso. And I call him Chie, an older brother. So the whole Chiorspai system, you don't use names. You use relative terms. And you give a name to a child when you are ready. You know, when you feel comfortable and ready. Then you find a sponsor for your child. Somebody that's going to be a role model for your child. You'll approach that person and say, would you be willing to sponsor my child next year? When I gave my child a name. If he or she accepts that, he or she has one year to prepare themselves for that day of the naming. If they pick you, the time comes, and as a woman you tie an eagle plume on a girl's hair, you've just gained a daughter. Or if he's, she's close to your age, you've just gained a kid's sister. But you have just taken somebody into your family. So these are really uh, meaningful and respected ceremonies. And if a name is given to you, you don't use it. 
daily. The only time you use that name is when you achieve something to bring honor to yourself, to your family, and to your people. Your Tiospaya will honor you for that achievement. That day, they'll sing a song with your name. That's the only time your name is used publicly. When we were in grade school, in Spring Creek, we were like maybe fourth or fifth graders. At that time, a, a certain age, they give you a pocket knife to show you that you're becoming a man. So if you get a pocket knife, man, you're just proud. You know? And you bring it to school and you show it off. You know, and everybody says, hey, he's a ata, kili, you know. <laughs> They're just proud of you, you know. Well, some of us ended up with some pocket knives. So we went out and carved our names. <laughs> we found some big trees and we carve our names on the initials on a tree, and then a Spring Creek Bridge. If you ever go down a Spring Creek, they changed it, but there was a time when that railings were all full of initials. <laughs> <coughs> so one day we were doing that. And I came home after school, and I don't know how mom knew it. But she fed me, and while I was eating, she said, you know, she said, they always tell us that uh, if you put your name in a public place, it becomes hui. You know, it becomes real hui. Can you remember that name? Word hui. Can you say it? Hui. Your name becomes Hu We. Anything that's Hu We is rotten. <laughs> really has that bad smell. <laughs> so they said, if you leave your name in public places, <laughs> you become your name becomes Hui. <laughs> so next day I went back to school and I told my friends. We went around, scratch our names out. <laughs> <laughs> I think. It's a way of teaching you not to become too self-centered. You, know, you practice relationship, you practice humility, but if you keep talking about yourself, you become very, what they call, egotistical, are self-centered. So to tell you stories like this to keep you from doing that. And you don't think about those things, but that's what it come out, you know, <coughs> is that you don't brag, you know. You don't brag about yourself. You know? So they tell little stories like that to kind of control you, you know, in how you behave. <coughs>
It is to be very strict in a church by as soon as a boy can talk. He is taught never to talk to his sister or female cousins and never look at them. Same way with a girl. As soon as that girl can talk, she's not allowed to talk to her brothers, male cousins, or look at them. You know, in those days, you live in a teepee, and you need to have invisible walls for privacy and respect. So you never talk to your sisters as a boy. You never argue with them, debate. I don't know if this is true, but I told a story of this family came to some kind of celebration. And this was when after wagons were given, they came in a team in a wagon. They came to the celebration, they set up their tent, unloaded their beddings and everything, ready to settle. The boy and his sister got into a fight publicly. They got into a fight, arguing, calling each other names. The family quietly load everything up, took the tent down, and left. When they got close to home, the boy jumped out, ran ahead. When they lived in a log house, so he went in, he came out with a rope, and he went to the canyons. So after they unloaded, the father followed him. He hung himself to bring honor back to the family. Because he did something that he wasn't supposed to. So, I don't know if that really happened, but they tell you those stories to say, that's how serious this is. Eventually, about your age, you might talk to your brothers, your sisters, but by then you will learn to respect yourself. You will speak to each other with respect, honor, you know. But you won't be fighting. And uh, I think sometimes today with our kids, I wish we still had practiced that. <laughs> you know, because our kids can fight over toys and you know. Yeah, and we uh, we need to think about those things. You know, what can we do? You know, and. Uh, but these are just some practices the Teospai system used to have. And every Teospai has several leaders. There will be an orator, a philosopher. There might be one or two healers. There might be a historian, person who keeps the winter count, to keep the history of the Teospaya. There will be an ethno-astronomer who watches the sun, the constellations, and the moon to tell you when the season changes and what must be done 
in that season. You're always preparing for the next season. They always say the greatest embarrassment you bring on to yourself is when you take somebody's time because you're not prepared. They said that's very embarrassing. It should be. Because you're born with everything you need. You, know. you have antibiotics in your system to address your health. And you have to know how to work with that. If you don't, if you don't listen, you get sick. No. You don't listen to your body. So, this is a way they used to practice, live. And there's a phrase, uh, I, I used to dance a lot. I sun danced for about 30 years. And then I used to powwow dance, the traditional dancers for many years. And I, I got to travel, you know, all over just to dance. And, and uh, one time I was listening to a song, and uh, they're honoring an individual. This individual was quite an achiever. And yet, he's not looked upon as somebody rich, but somebody who's very humble. And everybody loves him. With his achievement, he shared, he taught people how to do the same thing. So people come to him for advice. And they honored him. They sang a song for him. And in that song, uh, there's a phrase that says, Nake nula wa'un. Nake nula wa'un. I used to work with a medicine man for many years. They're the ones who started this course. And I worked with them. So when I heard that phrase, I said, what does that mean? It simply means I'm ready anytime any place for whatever I am prepared I said that's Indian time <laughs> the reason I said that was I remember in 1960s we used to go to conferences there was a lot of money for the reservations. And uh, so they handpicked some of us from different parts of the country to train, organize, and implement. So we did workshops across the country with different tribes. And by then, there was a lot of drinking. They legalized liquor to us in 1953. By 1960s, practically 100% of our reservation was affected. So, 
I went to a conference in Rapid City. And this workshop is supposed to start at 9 o'clock. I went down there and it was 9 o'clock, quarter after 9, 9.30. Some of us were in there and then there were some white people, teachers in that room. About 9.30 this guy came in, one of the organizers came in. And man, he looked rough. Looked like he was up all night. You know. Really had a bad hangover, but he came in, you know. And immediately, he looked at the white people. And he said, you white people, remember, this is an Indian conference. And we do things on Indian time when we're ready. That's where Indian time came. So when it's time, you're ready to go. So Indian time really came up in 1960s. And it's the poorest excuse we have for being late. <laughs> At that's about the same time, they had a big Indian dance in Oklahoma. And uh, after the supper break, the announcer said, okay, everybody, let's powwow. <laughs> powwow became the pan word across the country for any kind of Indian dance. <laughs> we used to say, Wachipo, dance. But even us, we use powwow. In Oklahoma, there's two stories. One was 50 went into battle and only one survived. And the other one was that 49 gold rush. People celebrated. So Indian people decided, let's celebrate too. <laughs> yeah, let's have a 49. They, they compose songs to, <laughs> and now you, all these uh, 49 songs have English words in it, you know, uh, it's really changed. So those are two stories that came out. So we've come through a lot, but knowing who you are, where you come from, will make you strong. And that's why we kept insisting, we've got to teach our young who we are. What they do with it, that's their decision, but at least they'll know. We like to do it in the schools. We're talking about the grade school that's coming up in Todd County. And uh, they ask uh, what our idea is about structure. And I said, I hope it will be like middle school. I said, you walk into middle school, it's a huge square building with a lot of square rooms inside, and you don't know where the hell you're at. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I like to see a compass, a complex, like the way people used to camp, a circle. I like to see the classrooms, circular, circular setting. So students can face each other, come to know each other, and not be embarrassed by each other. When you sit in lines, you know, it's really hard to work with. Isn't the new jail even built in that, that frame of thought? 
the jail was built with that thought and also a ceremonial area. You know, hopefully when uh, somebody's arrested and they're sentenced there, he'll go through cultural training to help him. Because our department here, we get calls from prisons all across the country. Inmates, they want a pipe, they want tobacco, sage, and uh, <coughs> one time, one of them wrote to me from uh, prison someplace out east. He said, they said we could build a sweat lodge and we want to do it traditionally. So we're wondering if you have about six or seven buffalo robes. <laughs> I, I wrote to him and I said, come and look at my sweat lodge. I said, it's got many colors, whatever blanket I can find. I said, that's what I'm using. <laughs> I said, I, I don't hunt, hunt a buffalo anymore. So <laughs> I use what I can get a hold of. You know. <laughs> so in a Teos Pai system, I want you to think about this. Next week, let's discuss a drinking party. Okay. Discuss drinking party, that handout. Compared to Land of Spotted Eagle, what you read there, and uh, the creation story, and uh, what do we discuss today? When I first read that story, I was so home and it was really different. Do you have any questions on the Teosh Pai system? We're going to talk about, from now on, everything we talk about is going to relate to the Teosh Pai system. Any ceremonies, any activities the Lakota people do, you're going to come back to the Tioshpa. But there is to be a lot of planning before a family starts. They said uh, uh, if a family has a beautiful daughter, there'll be uh, suitors. There'll be guys who likes to get her attention. So they'll bring the old man some horses as a gift. Say, so hey, I have these extra horses, you can have them, you know. And he'll look at those horses, and the way those horses look will tell him what kind of young man this is, you know. And if he accepts them, there's no obligation because he gives it to him you know, as a gift. So they said uh, sometimes a man with a beautiful daughter will end up with a lot of horses. <laughs> Anthropologists in the early trappers, missionaries, they saw that. And they tagged it as bargaining for a bride, purchasing a bride. They came from there, because they misunderstood. They thought they were purchasing a bride by bringing horses. But that wasn't so, you know, in those days. A girl is allowed to make her own choice, and she's guarded very carefully. So there's a lot of uh, respect in those days, especially with the women. 